Hello, and welcome to today's episode of the Authentic Uprising podcast. I'm your host, Jill Simons, and I'm so excited to grow in the radical art of standing in what God says about you with you today. The show is a place where we pour into the sense of who God is, who we are, and how we can live more in the freedom that He has for us every single day. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Authentic Uprising podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jill Simons, and I, you know, I'm always happy to be here with you. I am especially happy to be here with you today to continue talking about grace that has really been our focus for this quarter of the year and talking about the fact that grace is really real and grace has an effect. It truly changes us when we accept the grace that God has for us. And so to talk with me about that today, I have Laura Acuna. She is um, been struggling. She had struggled with her weight for over 50 years when the Lord finally set her free and showed her really where he was in that struggle that she had gone through. And so we're going to be talking about Laura's story today and using that as a lens to really look at no matter how literally heavy what you are going through might feel, the Lord always has grace for you. So Laura, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. So Laura, go ahead and share with us just how your story started a little bit that you shared with me before we got on the call today. Cause I think that that gives such good context to kind of the larger change in your story. Yeah. When I was 11 years old, a long time ago, I out of the blue sky gained 100 pounds when I was in the seventh grade, literally by the time I was leaving the ninth grade, just a few years later, I weighed well over 200 pounds on a five foot two body and everything changed everything changed. It was, I often describe it as a bomb going off in my life. And I woke up and I wasn't me anymore. I, I, I had been a, an excellent student in school. Teachers told my parents I was really bright. I started failing school. It had so many repercussions in my life, but one of the biggest ones was um, the, the heap of shame that just came over me because of this. And I'd lived that way for over 50 years. That is, yeah. And I think that there are so many weight is so specific. Like there's so many, um, shame things that come in with that because of what our culture kind of believes as a whole about what gaining weight means about you as a person. And I've absolutely experienced this as I've gained more with each of my four pregnancies. I have, I've seen that firsthand in myself. And, you know, um, as you're saying this to me, Grace is the antidote for shame. Max Licato says the the cure for guilt and shame is God's grace. Absolutely. And so you just mentioned gaining weight with each baby. So did I. And that's normal. Our bodies are supposed to do that. But yet we beat ourselves up and, and the culture beats us up about the natural things that happen to a woman's body over time. Our bodies are meant to change. They, they're they created that way. And there's grace for that. But we don't we don't get that from the outside world. Yeah, absolutely. And we see this in aging as well, you know, even weight detached when there's just the basic and more in women than men, we see like there's those, that criticism for allowing time to happen. And like you said, God's grace is there for these things that happen to us. And so how did you specifically experience God's grace? I know it was much later in the story, but how did you experience his grace breaking in to where you were in your shame after that struggle? So I'm a world-class stuffer, a recovering world-class stuffer. So that's why I turned to food as a young girl. I was stressed. I had anxiety. I probably had some good old-fashioned ADD that was manifesting at that time, which does happen to girls in middle school, around middle school age, but it was all undiagnosed, untreated. And so I just carried on And the only thing I knew to do was to keep trying again and trying again to lose the weight, thinking that that was going to change what was inside of me. And I found that even when I starved myself down to a size five, I was still me. I still had the same problems, the same issues, the same fears. Only this time, 
I was at what was added to that was my fear of gaining it all back, which of course I did every single time. So, you know, time, it's a long, long and winding story too much for today. But basically what happened, what my tipping point was, was when my mother died and my best friend died within the span of three months of each other. I then um, immediately started caring for my very sick father and the pressure and the grief and the um, chaos really that, that, that came over me during that time was too much for me to stuff. I couldn't do it anymore. And so I felt like God said in my spirit, you know, Laura, it is too much for you. Would you please give it to me? Please <laughs> finally give it to me. And so I did that in the form of going to find a skilled therapist who um, specialized in women like me. And also, of course, you know, putting God first in all of this and truly handing it over to him. And it made all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And so you shared with me just briefly about your walk with that therapist. And it sounds like she was such a conduit of that healing that the Lord wants to bring through his grace, which I think is so important to talk about. A lot of times we talk about the extraordinary um, intervention of God, which we know is real and tangible and beautiful, but also how much God desires to reach us through the brothers and sisters that he places in our life with skills, like you said, that are able to really be him to us in the midst of those things. Absolutely. There's a saying, I love it. It it goes like this psychology reveals, but Jesus heals. Mm. And so all glory goes to him for any healing, but he does use skilled guides who are well-educated, who have big hearts for whatever it is that we're struggling with. And this therapist was an angel to me. She extended grace to me from the beginning and it was so hard to receive it from her. I I was so uncomfortable with yeah. her being so kind to me and so grace filled. Now, look, my husband's always been wonderful and supportive and great. He's loved me faithfully for 39 years, you know, but having this other woman, I don't know. There was something about her just loving me for me that was uncomfortable at first. I had to learn how to receive it. Mm-hmm. You know, she then walked me through. Can you accept that at 11 years old with no power? with all these things going on around you, that you did something that was reasonable for you at the time. And I can remember sitting in the chair with my arms crossed going, no, no, it was bad. It was terrible. It was awful. She she kept revisiting that with me over and over again till finally I was like, you know, that little girl, that little girl had no other option. And then I had grace on myself. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's one of the biggest steps is self-compassion and grace, because that's how God looks at us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I thought, I thought the voice of shame was God. Yes. I, I see that in so many people's struggle where there's that idea, especially culturally, you talk to an atheist about like, describe the God you don't believe in, you know, and I have never had someone do that where I was like, oh, well that you just described my God, <laughs> like, and you don't believe right. in him. It's always, it's always this idea of this condemning, like shame filled, um, power hungry, you know, distortion of God. That is what they're uncomfortable with. And I always say me too. Like, I don't, you know, I'm not on board with that either. And that self-compassion is something that we're so about here on the podcast with our tagline being the radical art of standing in what God says about you and how uncomfortable that is. Like you mentioned receiving. Absolutely. I mean, I can remember, I mean, I always felt that I'd blown it at age 11, that I'd absolutely blown God's plan for my life. I believed in him all my life, but I thought, you know, that he really is, he has to love me because he's God, but he does not like me. And he is not going to give me my plan A life. He's just not going to because I've blown it. And the therapist said to me, how old is, how old is your son? You know, and I, I was telling my young, giving her my youngest son's age. And she said, okay, so when he was 12, could he have done anything that ha- would, would push him far from God and ruin his life forever? I mean, would you condemn him to that? And I said, of course not. And she said, why are you doing that to yourself? But we get these limiting beliefs, these lies rooted in our brains. And that's, that's what kept me stuck for so long, this hamster wheel. Mm-hmm. I've I just got to figure it out. I just got to figure out a better diet for me. I've got to give up some food group forever. And you know, whatever. It, it just, 
the answer is God's grace because I have found that now that I've learned to love my body, even though I want to tweak it, I want to improve it. I've learned to love myself, to extend grace to myself. Then I'm going to make a big girl decision about how I'm going to proceed, how I'm going to treat my body. And it's going to be in a gentle way. Yeah. It's not going to be in some harsh thing, some legalistic, crazy thing I'm going to do to try to fit into some standard that who knows who is putting on me. That is not what God is putting on me. Yeah. Not at all. Absolutely. And so as you break down what you walked through, and maybe this is kind of an odd question, but I'd love for people who, so people that are in the before, like where Mm -hmm. they are still, whether it's weight, whether it's a habitual sin, whether it's an addiction, whether it's something, a trauma that happened to them as a child that has been a defining feature of their life. When you're in the before, what are the things that you say, okay, God, this is your responsibility. And what are the things that you really do need to own and say, this is my responsibility um, and and the breakdown of those things. Cause I think that everybody's ready to like, oh, take on the shame and take on like, this is my fault and stuff like that. But I think mm-hmm. once you've walked through it, there's a different clarity about what is God's responsibility in the situation and what is my responsibility in the situation to move from the before to the after. That, that's a great question because um, one of the areas where I was stuck and I, I've been a women's ministry leader for almost 23 years. So I see this in other women all the time. And that is that we get stuck in immaturity. Our childhood coping mechanisms, we're, we're still turning to them and they're obsolete. They don't work anymore. They're not appropriate for a grown woman, you know, that loves and follows Jesus. Now that's not a shame statement. But what I'm saying is that we, we need to grow up and own our stuff. So we can't spend our lives saying, well, my mother said this to me or my dad said that to me. And, and the teacher said that, or this, you know, I'm just the way I am. We don't get to do that as Christian women. We are responsible for growing up in Christ. And there isn't a single one of us, not a single one who doesn't have baggage they've got to work through. We all come into this world broken and we get broken over and over again, but we are responsible. So, so that would be the first step. God then you know, invites us into healing all the time. He's always restoring. He's always repairing. He's always redeeming, but it's our choice whether or not we're going to join him in his work. And once we do, there are some things we're going to have to do. Maybe it will be going to a therapist. Maybe it will be going to a women's Bible study that's safe and healthy where we can have accountability. It might be both those things. It was for me. It might be, you know, some discipline that you need to add to your life, specifically more time with him and time in his word. But there are things that we must do. There's not a magic wand that comes down from heaven and goes, poof, you're done. (laughs) It doesn't work that way because he is always teaching us along the healing path. And we would never learn those things if it didn't take some time. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you are the voice of maturity that so many people need in this situation now. And that's really what is your book is about is, is inviting women into, um, the beginning of that journey that you yourself experienced, correct? Yes. And, and in the book, there's, there's a day, it's a 31 day devotional. So every day is a different topic, but there's a day talking about putting away childish things. We're not children anymore. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to grow up. And that is my story. I possessed a wide array of immature coping mechanisms and childish behaviors way past the age it was appropriate. And the Lord really came, he came through very loud and clear with me on that. And that started me on, that was the beginning of all this, even before my tipping point, the Lord was growing me and and, um, teaching me about what it looked like to be a mature, spiritually and emotionally mature Christian woman um, for for a long time, still is. I'm not Mm -hmm. there yet. Yeah. I love that. So I have never heard this idea positioned in the exact way that you're positioning it. And I absolutely love it because that is then so much of what we receive in scripture about really the beauty of growing and the beauty of aging and getting to walk with the Lord into old age and what a gift that is and how much we've lost that in a society that kind of takes it for granted that we're going to, you know, most people are going to see old age. And I think that that's something we see that the most peace comes, that the Holy Spirit is able to bring us the most peace when we live most in line with what is really real. And I, I see that echoed in what you're saying about, you know, childish things really should be relegated to childhood, not in terms of like the childlike way we 
uh, interact with God and have that reliance on him. But the way that we cope as children with the hard things in life and how when we're an adult and we're trying to use those childish coping mechanisms, there's really like a disjoint, a disjointedness in the reality that we're trying to live in that does doesn't foster that peace that the Holy Spirit's inviting us into. Absolutely. And we fear, we fear living in reality. I mean, that, that's a scary thing, but the Lord is so faithful because when you do live in reality, when you allow him to speak to you honestly, and you listen during your time with him, when you're praying and, and conversing and listening to him, um, he's so kind. He's so kind. He's direct. You know, he'll tell you the truth, but he's so kind. We don't have to fear that. We really don't. There is a part in my book about aging, because mm -hmm. that's another thing I went kicking and screaming into. Believe me, I'm 64 years old. I'm a grandmother now. And I had to make up my mind. You know, I'm either going to be ridiculous about this and hate it, or I'm going to embrace it and look at all the beautiful um, things that I have in my life that I couldn't have any other way if I didn't live till 64. Meaning my granddaughter, my adult relationship with my children, the wisdom and life experience that I've had the faithfulness of God over 64 years. I mean, it's just amazing. So again, as an older woman, I do not want to spend the rest of my life on some hamster wheel trying to grasp something that I can't grasp anyway. It's, it's futile. Yeah. That is so beautiful. I am. So I turned 33 this spring and it's funny because I just, there was like a meme on Facebook or something that had like all the nineties boy bands. And it was like, if you had a crush on one of these people, it's probably time for an under eye cream. And I was like, no, <laughs> like where have we come to? And so I'm, I'm feeling like I'm just right at the beginning of, like you said, that decision of how am I going to do this? Like I can be, you know, angsty about it. And that doesn't help anybody, or I can really see the gift that is in it to move forward. And I think that that's ultimately, um, that maturity as Christians is what we see in the, especially like I'm thinking right now of like the apostles and the early church, these people that were able to go into these very trying times, these very hard things with the Lord, because, there was a maturity to that relationship and how really, if we're not experiencing that in our lives, that's the first invitation is to come to know Christ as healer in a way that allows us to find really safety and solace in that relationship. It's so true. It, it's so true. And the culture is pressing down. I have a story in the book of when I was your age and I saw wrinkles around my eyes and I thought, oh my God, you know, it, I, I remember to this day and I, I say in the book, I don't actually think they were wrinkles. I think I was just a tired mom because I had three little boys at the time and I was out at a Christmas party and you know what it takes to get out the door. So, but for me, it was a crisis. It just was, I couldn't believe it. We get these messages so early on so early on and we hear it from everywhere and again god's grace covers all of that we can trust him to live in the reality of our situation we can we only have so much brain space years ago i was at a an event for women who struggle with disordered eating it was right at the beginning of my healing journey i really didn't understand a lot of it yet and the speaker said what if your brain was freed up to think more about the things of god and i thought is my brain take is my brain being taken up by dieting and food and body image and what am i going to wear and what do i look like and who saw me last time was i skinny then whatever all this crazy talk it hit me like a ton of bricks i thought i have no idea what that's like but i do now oh. i do now yeah the obsession is gone hmm. god wants us to live in freedom hmm. in freedom he doesn't want us tied up with things that don't matter it, 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 our health matters he wants us to take care of our bodies, but he doesn't, he's not looking at a number on a scale. He's not saying to me, look, Laura, once you weigh 120 pounds, you know, then uh, I'll talk to you about using you in, in this world, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we yeah. think that way. 
Absolutely. And I think that's tied up so much with identity. I think that though my story has kind of a different flavor in parts, I also struggled with disordered eating in high school um, and was very, very tiny. And then just kicking and screaming through every pregnancy, gaining the weight. Um, And then actually I got in the best shape of my life. Um, It was the one and only time where I got pregnant, like right when I wanted to get pregnant and everything worked out the way that I wanted it. And I actually lost that pregnancy. And so there was just this huge, um, huge impact of like, man, I really don't still control everything. And even having all of these pieces in place exactly how I wanted to, I don't make the rules here. And so then actually in the time since I have had many, you know, like thyroid issue, health issues that have kept me from moving forward on my weight journey. But it's so beautiful because that's been the time period that the Lord is like, let's work on your identity now. Like, let's go in and detach all of these things to where now I'm the heaviest I've ever been in my life, not pregnant. And I don't think about it anymore. Like, so I am right there with you where there's just a, you know, there's any times that I think about it, I'm like, okay, some more vegetables and things like that, you know, right. but um, it's not something that is kind of the constant like murmur in my brain the way that it would have been 10 years ago all the shoulds you know all the shoulds and and rule making that sucked there's so much legalism with that um what i was taught to do was to listen to my body i'd shut it off i was like a head walking around (laughs) i didn't want to connect to my body i didn't even know what that was so we worked really hard on me listening to what it was telling me because your body is always telling you things It tells you when you're thirsty. It tells you when you're tired, tells you when you're sick. It tells you when you're hungry and it tells you when you're full. It also tells you when you need to eat some vegetables. It tells you it's time to stop that. Now the cookies are over. Christmas has happened. Now it's time to get back on on track. But that track isn't a diet. That track is feeding your body what it needs when it needs it. Not going to bed hungry because you used up all your calories for the day. Not you know, going to bed with a headache because you gave up all your carbs and you're suffering and your body needs some, that kind of thing. It's, it's a grace filled, hmm, curiosity, thinking, um, you know, what do I need to eat today, Lord? What, you know, within mind, three square meals. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And I think that that, I always talk about like the grace being in the middle ground where it's so much easier to fall to an extreme because we can kind of just like collapse there and just be like, Mm -hmm. well, I'm just going to like throw myself into keto and that's like going to be the answer sort of thing because I don't want to have to do the more like tedious moment to moment kind of walk with the Lord things that really does lie in the middle ground and, or to just, oh, I'm just not going to care about anything and not, you know, care about how I look and stuff like that and just kind of collapse on the other side of things. And so there really is so much grace if we're willing to listen, I think. And that's the word that you keep using that keeps coming up when we're willing to listen to where grace is in the moment and walk in that middle ground without that kind of abandon and feels like maybe freedom, but it's actually not freedom. It's that like just, um, passivity, I think that comes with falling into an extreme. It's an illusion of control. When I'm starving myself on a diet and I'm doing well in my, in my thought process, I'm, my stomach's hungry. I'm being very disciplined. I feel like I'm in control until I can't do it anymore. And the weight boomerangs back totally out of my control now. And I get, I even gain more. I heard someone say their therapist said to them, oh, you're going on a diet in January. How much weight are you planning on gaining? Because you had to, I thought that was funny because it's so true. The boomerang, it just keeps putting more pounds on and more pounds on because your body is trying to save you from starving itself. It's trying to protect itself because it's a brilliant thing. The body it's, it's just brilliant, but it is this control thing. Um, controlling our emotions, controlling our bodies, controlling, controlling. And like you said so eloquently that you learned through your miscarriage and we all learned in COVID, we're not in control of anything. Mm -hmm. We're not in control of anything. So surrender is the right uh, posture. In the scripture, be still and know that I'm God. One of the translations is stop striving Mm. and know that I'm God. So it requires some, some laying down 
of the struggling, straining, striving, fixing, all of that. And like I said, just spending time with God and allowing him to speak to you and let this miraculous body of ours speak to us. I love that. I love that so much. Well, Laura, we are almost out of time. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Go ahead and give us the name of your book. I'm going to link it in the show notes so that people can check it out, but go ahead and give us just a brief overview of what that is for people that might be interested. Thank you. It's called Still Becoming Hope, Help, and Healing for the Diet Weary Soul. It's a 31-day devotional. There is a soul fitness exercise every day. It's a journaling prompt and a prayer. And it's my hope that women will be able to, if they can, no legalism here, lay down dieting for 31 days and see what God does. I love that. I love any time that we like give something to God and be like, let's see what he does with it. And we're always like blown away. <laughs> so yes, yes, yes. Hey, and I have one other thing I wanted to sh- um, share with you real quick yeah. that lines up with your podcast. Mm-hmm. So if you subscribe to my um, newsletter on my website, um, you will receive a PDF with these scripture cards um, that you can print off and print. Mine were printed at Staples, um, but they are the names that God calls you and the scripture that backs it up. So this is in line with what you've been saying that we need to walk in with who God says we are. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to put the direct link to that on Laura's website in our show notes so that you can check it out. I hope you guys have the best week, Laura. Thanks so much for being with me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode of the Authentic Uprising podcast. It is always a joy to be with you. I encourage you to subscribe to our podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, whichever place you most prefer or do it all if that is what floats your boat. We would love to continue to get to know you better and grow in relationship with you. And so I encourage you to check out the links in both our show notes and our YouTube description that tell you more about where you can connect with us elsewhere. The two big things we have going on besides the podcast is our shop that is full of reminders of who you are in God, helping you to really grow in that radical art of standing in who you are and giving gifts that help others to do the same. The other big thing we have going on is the Uprising Academy. This is all of our formation um, programs, workshops, retreats. Everything is available virtually and on demand where you can sign up and continue to learn more about radically standing in what God says about you especially if you are in a place in your life where you are not being fed the way that you long to be fed, whether it's in your community, whether it's at your church, whatever it is, there is more for you and we can absolutely walk with you into it through the Uprising Academy. All those links are in our show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to leave a review. Reviews are the number one way that we help get in front of new faces new people that are able to be touched by the radical art of standing and what God says about us. I love you. I'm praying for you. I hope you have an amazing week.